Yo, what is up, guys? Welcome to the Tony and Dakota podcast. Today, we got a special guest who actually grew up in the same hometown as us, and that is Kendall Tucky. So today we got Mr. Bobby Bolin. Bobby Bolin with Big City Cars. <laughs> and he's got like he's got more dealerships than that. If you guys think he only owns one dealership, you are wrong. I was looking at all the businesses that he owns. He's got real estate. He's got all kinds of stuff going on. And then I think Dakota was getting him to drop some of the secrets of the business when we were in Vegas with him. <laughs> and uh, and Bobby Bobby's always acting like he's impressed with the stuff that we're doing. He's like, oh man, you guys made that much money? Wow, that's crazy. And then he started showing us his numbers and we were like, Pfft. <laughs> it is it is impressive what you guys have accomplished for sure no question about it no question about it and you did it by yourself i mean yes so many guys are successful and you you have to look at it you know when when success starts my thing is like okay where'd they get it how'd they do it right mm -hmm. like i weigh heavier on guys that are self-made mm -hmm. you know they uh there's that adage that a lot of people talk about is you know, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard this. It says, um, um, my son will drive a, a Lamborghini mm -hmm. and then the next generation as it goes, because we get weak, we get weak mm -hmm. as, as we hand businesses off. Um, but being self-made is, it's a feat in itself, but you guys are well on your way. You know that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I've heard, I've heard that one before too. It's the, he's like, I, I'm driving a Range Rover, my son will drive a mercedes his son will drive a ferrari and then after that the next son will be back walking to work exactly like on his feet walking exactly. to work because yep. strong men create easy yep. times yep. and then easy times create weak men absolutely have you been thinking about investing in real estate? It's not like what you see on HGTV. We created a course to show you how to really invest and create a profitable flipping and wholesaling business. We give you marketing strategies like how to pull lists, who we target, and where we find the money. We go over sales, which includes live calls and negotiations, scripts, role playing, and so much more. Everything that you need to know to flip houses is in this course. And if there's anything that we missed, we will create a video to answer your specific question. This knowledge has made us over a million dollars and we're selling it today for just $997. Click the link below. Yep. All right, so I wanna hear about your first job. I've never even heard about this. What is your oh. first job and like, where did you get started at? So we know you grew up in Kenneville, but where did you get started working? Um, first job. It's a little toss up there. So um, back in the day, the grocery store, uh, I worked or I lived in government subsidized housing. Mm. Um, a lot of people will hear me say things like carriage house strong and they have mm. no idea what I'm talking about. But as you drive around Fort Wayne specifically, you'll see the Section 8 housing and it'll say Gene B. Glick, right? So big investor, so Section 8 housing. Um, I grew up in that. Uh, carriage house in Kinderville, Indiana, and and first official job was probably I think I was thirteen. Um, I was supposed to be fifteen, but I lied. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we would we'd get picked up at the grocery store, and so I was able to walk like one oh, block yeah. there. And we would go to Michigan and detassel corn. I mean, it, it, you you really start to show your age at this point in life because like they would never let p kids do that now. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the, the legalities and all of those things. But uh, detasseling corn was probably the first job. Um, unfortunately, it was only seasonal. As I grew up a little bit, you know, a, a few years into that, I was a dishwasher at Linda's Breakfast House on Main Street in Kendallville. Wow. Yeah. First job. Um, yeah, did you have to... Legally, you weren't allowed to wash dishes unless you had a cigarette in your mouth. <laughs> it's funny. It's, it's funny that you say that. It's like so many people in the kitchen still smoked, and yeah. it was like, you know, the, the entire restaurant was completely full of smoke, yeah. right? Like, we've really come a long way as a society, right? So, 100%. yeah. That was my first job. Um, kind of went on with life, you know. That was like the high school job for myself. Um, got out of high school and then did what most people do in that Northeast Indiana is I went to trailer factories, right? Mm -hmm. I uh, didn't go to college. Um, I saw the income level there and I went to the trailer factories and I was like, wow, man, I'm going to be rich. Yep. Right. And so 
you know, it's manual labor. Um, it was nice because I was done. I was off work at, I was off work noon. at noon. And I was like, man, this is, this is the life. And I started doing that. And then I started washing cars. Mm. Um, started washing cars. As a side business? Uh, no, at, at, at a dealership. So mm. started washing cars and, and was and was like, you know, okay, this is, I'm off at noon. What else am I going to do, right? Mm. Um, started washing cars and um, kind of kind of got a little sucked into the car dealership aspect of it. And um, then that kind of landed my role in, in auto and automotive. You was know? it like Wolf of Wall Street where somebody came up to you and they told you how much money they made and then you were like, you show me your paycheck, I will quit right, right now. now. Right <laughs> now. <laughs> no, no. Um, those, th those, times, those times were just a little different, right? Um, you know, my, uh, I guess the one guy that I kind of like really attribute to like um, giving me the direction was Shane Householder, if you know yeah. Shane. Oh, yeah. Um, He's from Kenderville, too. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, crazy in, in Fort Wayne, like, a lot of the really good managers come from Kenderville. Yeah. Right? So. That's where all the good people come from. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> hard workers. Hard workers. Yeah, hard working farm boys. No, um, I had um, I had two friends, Trent Buell and Shane Householder, both in automotive. Trent was a salesman at the time. Uh, Shane was a manager, and they're like, you need to, like, get out of that garbage and come sell cars. Mm -hmm. And um, that's when I really had that transition and got into sales. Um, and then, of course, got into sales and found out what, you know, Shane Householder made in those days. And I was like, oh, okay, I need that job. Yeah. Like, yeah. What do I got to do to get that job? He's like, well, you got to master that one first. Mm -hmm. So that really, really started me down that path, you know. Um one of my first man management jobs is as as I was selling cars and and you know this when you get to the, your you know the top of your game and it's pretty easy to know if you're at your top of your game because you're making gross profit and you're selling volume so yeah. like making the best of both that's it yeah. right um, when you're at that top of your game the next thing you're is like okay what's you know I don't want to do this forever I mean the money's good but like now what's next and you want to get into that management role. And then Doug McKibben was the first guy who said, let me give you the manager job, right? And so I went into finance. And So what dealership was this, by the way? Glenbrook Dodge. Oh, it was? Mm -hmm. You started off as washing cars, and you went to salesperson. No, I was washing cars in Kendallville. Okay. Um, washed cars in Kendallville, and then went to sales at Bob Rorman. Okay. Yep, and uh, Fort Wayne Toyota Lexus Kia. Yep. Um, only left there to get into management at Glenbrook. Got it. Yep. So worked for Doug for a few years, um, was at the top of my game, made a ton of money, blew all of it plus some. Um, On what? Everything, just like. <laughs> well, I just saw him playing blackjack, so he can't. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Uh, everything, like, um, honestly, back in the days, like, we didn't, the internet wasn't that big of a thing, right? Mm -hmm. And you can you only learn based off of who you're around and mm -hmm. who you're with, right? Um, Paul Webb was one guy who always kind of instilled in me. was like, hey, save your money. Hey, like, save your money. And, mm -hmm. you know, later in life, I've always I called him and said, hey, you know, you, you were one guy that I listened to kind of the most. Um, at that time, I didn't really listen, you know? I mean, I heard him, but like, I wasn't listening. I mean, I heard you, but I'm not listening. And and so those were the things. And, and when you're making that kind of money, you just think it's gonna last forever, yeah. right? People do. They make these big 100%. mistakes because they think, okay, that money's gonna be forever. And, yeah. and you know, why not blow that whole check at the bar, quite frankly, right? Mm -hmm. Why not blow that whole check at the bar, got carried away, we'll make it again next month, yeah. right? Um, and uh, you know my 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 period at Glenbrook ended. I was done. Glenbrook's over. Um, they made a management change, um, and at that time I didn't know what I was going to do. Right, so I took a management job in Indianapolis, which was very tough because I, ha I have a son. Right, and I'm not with his mom, and so it was very very tough. So I moved to Indianapolis, and I'm like driving back here every other weekend and doing that stuff, which is extremely tough. Um, but I got into Glim or I got into uh, Indianapolis and really took off financially, making money, right? But then it was like, what are you going to do with it? Mm -hmm. 
My problem is, is in Indianapolis, I went, I bought too much house, mm. spent too much money, and it was crazy because when my income increased, I looked back and at the end of the year, yeah, no I didn't have any more money. Yeah. Like, the more I made, the more I spent. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until probably 2004 that I said, man, I'm dumb. Like, I'm financially dumb. I'm, I'm a financial moron. Mm -hmm. And in around 2004, I said, I'm not going to do this anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm not doing it. So yeah. what I did, which was completely different than all of my peers, I started saving. I know everybody says, don't save. Well, I knew nothing about investing. I wasn't in real estate at the time. I had nothing going on. I said, I'm just gonna save it till I figure it out. Um, started saving and saving and saving. Um, in 2006, I'd moved back to Fort Wayne and I had a nice nest egg saved up, nothing invested. And then I started getting into real estate and I'm like, I'm gonna buy this house Back in 06, flipping wasn't flipping mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like it is today, right? Like way more people want to do it today than they did then. And mm -hmm. so um, still wasn't like a real good time to get in because you had 2008 coming up. Correct. So Bobby, like picked yeah. the worst time to get started. <laughs> yeah. The, the blessing that I had there, the blessing that I had is that I, I was out in prior to 08. I got in, started flipping. I had no inventory. I was... I wasn't hiring anything out unless it was, you know, certified plumbers or electricians. I was doing everything myself. Wow. So I did all the painting. I was doing roofing. I was doing whatever I could do. I was doing it on my own. Wow. My, working a sales job or? Yeah. Running a dealership. I would go on the weekends and fix this house or fix that house. And, and I would just do it on my own. Yeah. Uh, I felt the money was made in the labor, right? Yeah. Which right. We know later in life, yeah. that's not. Right. That is not where it's at. Right. But. When you first start, you think, gosh, if I can just do this all myself, I'm yeah. going to make so make much more, more money. money yeah. well, How many no. did you do, like three houses before you were like, nah? I was doing, I, I, I'd probably say I probably got into like seven or eight. On your own? On my all own. On your own? Yeah. Oh my gosh, you didn't get tired of it? No. Sooner than that? No, because, because when I was making the windfall selling the real estate, I was like, wow. That's a big chunk. And, and, and the, the, the period of time, I mean, yeah. we're talking long periods of time. I would own two houses. And then I would say, okay, this is going to be a flooring week. I go do the flooring there, and I go do the flooring over there, oh, right? Nice. So um, that job's easier when you when it's repetition. Yeah, so hundred percent. So I, I had this firm believer, being a worker, right? Because we have this. Yep. People have this concept that being a worker, that's where the money's made. Or it's admirable. Yeah. It's like hard Honor, work. Honorable, yeah. Honorable, and, yeah. And 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 that's just it, it. You learn later that that's not the case, mm -hmm. right? Like. The, you know, that's part of the, you know, business strategy that we look at today is like when I'm paying someone the mentally you think, well, gosh, if I have to pay somebody, I'm losing. Mm -hmm. No, yeah. I want to pay a lot of people. Yeah, I want to, I want, you know, you got to keep your employees to this or employees to that employees are problems. No, that's the opposite. Like I want as many employees as I can get. Right. And that's it's it's a real fine line between knowing that and not knowing it right yeah. so um i'm flipping houses i kind of liquidate my inventory in that like prior to 08 mm -hmm. um at that particular time i'd come back from indy i'm back in fort wayne and um i'm working for bob Rorman, and he paid me well and unlike my peers at this particular time um my income was substantial, mm -hmm. substantial six-figure income, but I didn't live in a two hundred thousand dollars house. When you say substantial, you can give us solid numbers. Like, what were you making then? Uh, north of four hundred. And then, what year was this? Two thousand six, two thousand six, two thousand seven, two thousand six and seven. Um, my compensation overall uh, from the employer was uh, two eighty five. And then you would paid a bonus. But I also received some bonuses, and then I also received money from the manufacturer as well. Jeez. Uh, um, you know, new Kias at the particular that particular time, they were giving me a kickback of a minimum of $100 per car. Wow. Okay? As a sales manager, I got an override, 100 minimum. You had Kia Sedonas that were paying 350 
Holy smokes. Right? And you're selling, what, like 150 cars? A month? 125, 150. That's insane. Now, my big thing is is to make sure my employer didn't know about it because they had already authorized it, but I didn't want them to cut my compensation right. based off knowing what I'm yeah. getting on the kickback, right? <laughs> right. So um, it was just kind of funny because as I um, – as I as I the the funds they give you is on a credit card, so you have to go to the ATM machine. You only take out four hundred, so it's like every day four hundred. Every day, you just live in your 20s, life on that card right? in twenty. So you're coming yeah. home, you're trying to pay everything on that card. They think you're manif- They think you're uh, <laughs> embezzling or like doing yeah. some weird movement of stuff. Well, you have your cash. You have all this cash. Yeah. And, you know, people are like, "Whoa, you're real careful." Right. And so, <laughs> so I was making a great income, and. Um, Instead of being like my peers, because I watch so many of them, like it just it, 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 so many of them that just go broke mm-hmm. because they lose their job. We go through a recession like 08. We mm-hmm. go through something crazy and they don't have the money because mm-hmm. they've got the boat payment, the lake house payment, the house payment that they're living well above their means, mm-hmm. wearing double Rolexes. Mm-hmm. Dumb. At that particular time. I had made that money by liquidating my inventory prior to 08. We get into 08. Automotive is not great Mm -hmm. at all. Yeah. Uh, But opportunity in real estate at that time was unbelievable. Yep. Um, And if you had the capital, because nobody wanted to do loans. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. So I'm at Bob Rorman's. My income completely went down to nothing. Mm -hmm. Uh, At that time, I decided to partner up with... um, uh, Butler Automotive Group down in Indianapolis. We had some buy-in opportunity on a Nissan store. Um, my initial deal with Rob Butler was to buy into the Nissan store, but I needed a substantial amount of capital. So I had the savings, but I needed more. Hmm. I had a house southwest, and I tried to do a cash-out refi in 2008. Good yeah. luck. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. So I actually had to sell the house. So I sold the house. You sold the house to buy in? Yeah. All right, when you say substantial, we got to know solid numbers, too. How much was it to buy in? Because I've always wanted to know how much it is to buy in a dealership. Well, my percentage was very, very small, but we're talking a half million dollars. Okay. Okay. And um, it had to be cash because the banks weren't giving money. Absolutely. So it was all cash. And um, so I had to, you know, round up as much money as I can to try and buy into this dealer group, um, one store. Mm-hmm. And so I'm, I'm kind of putting cash back, ready for the Where were you going to live, too? So you sold your house, and you're yeah. like, hey, uh, I'm going to need your help, kids. I need your help uh, getting this <laughs> rental property ready that yeah. I was going to flip. So I have, I, have, I have no real estate. I sold my house, and I sold it cheap because it is 08. Yeah. And I couldn't, and I had equity, but I couldn't get the cash out refi. Mm-hmm. Um, so I moved into an apartment in Huntington. Uh, at that time, I was married, um, and she was pregnant with uh, our first son, and um, she wanted to be close to her mom. Um, ultimately, we were talking about moving to Indy because I'm going to buy into this store. And and um, reluctantly, I agreed to move into this apartment in Huntington. Um, so I move into this this apartment in Huntington. It's 700 square feet. Wow. Okay. We just left like yeah a big house, and yeah. now we're in 700. <laughs> it's funny because it's funny because people would drive by, and they'd be like. What do you got going on in there? And I'm like, what are you talking about? And they're like, it's just the lights that come through your front window. Do you have a tanning bed? And it was actually my television because I had a, a, a big <laughs> television. But, like, you could sit on the couch and you could touch the front of the TV. Oh That's my hilarious. God. It was huge. Yeah. So we, you had, you had a, a television for a 5,000 square foot house right. at a 700, 700 square, square foot, foot right? apartment. Yeah, crazy. Um, I'll never forget that time I had so much money. Um, set back for the buy-in of the Nissan store. And um, my uh, m- my ex-wife calls, um, and her name is Abby. So Abby calls and says, I think the garage door's broken. And I'm like, what are you talking about? She says, I can't get in. It, it, it's not working. In reality, what it was is my electric got shut off. Oh, snap. Okay. My electric got shut off because I knew with the income that I have, you've got to pay for your applied credit, your credit card, your loans, or this or that. You pay that because you can get some grace period. You can be late on your electric bill, and it's not going to affect your credit, oh, right? Yeah. <laughs> Unless it goes to collection. So, right. so I, I, I had to call my mother-in-law and say, hey, can you put – 
my electric bill on your credit card and, and then I'll just pay you on Friday. And so she did. Wow. Then it was the water later in the week. Same thing, <laughs> right? Oh my gosh. So not only are you trying to buy into a dealership, right? To, but also it's not making money. It's yep. you're in a wait, you're in a recession, yeah. yep. right? So we're not, at that time, we're not carrying, it's a Nissan store, we're not carrying these big Nissan Armadas and, and these big, big expensive stuff because of the floor plans and the interest and all of that. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing at that particular time is we're carrying Nissan Versus and Sentras, the small, small Nissans, right? Yep. And we're just kind of lawfling. I'm driving from Huntington to Indianapolis every single day working car dealership hours. It's crazy. Yeah. But then we had cash for clunkers. Oh right? yeah. Cash for clunkers came out. We sold because to get this additional rebate for the consumer from yep. the government, you had to increase the gas mileage on the vehicle. Mm -hmm. And I had all the cheap inventory yep. because I wasn't taking the big flashy stuff, but we sold a ton, made great money, started to kind of be back in the game a little bit. Um, stayed with him and then got and then it was, you know, 2008, 2009, I'm making good money and I'm like it's time to get back into the real estate side. Mm -hmm. So I'm taking every monthly check that I have and I'm buying a house. Wow. I mean, I'm buying houses for $8,000. Right. <laughs> and, and and I'm not talking about I'm not the houses that we buy for $8,000. <laughs> yeah, I'm not Yeah, I'm not talking about I mean, they're 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 habitable wow like now mm -hmm. wow. yeah they made some paint and carpet but that's about it so i'm right. buying these houses and I'm, I'm kind of buying a few and i'm buying one here and buying one there started to get in the rental business finally i move out of the apartment and i bought a a fifty two thousand dollar house okay and i paid cash for that house and lived in that home while i still kind of built built the wealth um ended up um out of the nissan deal and i'm still buying real estate still buying some more and buying some more um i decided to come back to fort wayne and go right back to Rormans, and we are Sling and metal, we're coming out of that recession. It's 2010, 2011. We're making money again. Everything's great. Um, I end up meeting a guy kind of by by chance. His name is Lee Pasco. Mm -hmm. He works for the bank. Um, yeah, I think you gave me his information. Yeah, actually. yeah, yeah. I met Lee Pasco and. Um, Lee and I got together. We had ended up buying, I, I can't remember the exact number. I think we bought, we had an investor that wanted to retire, had 30 homes or give or take. And um, Lee and I kind of bought those together. Um, uh, we bought those homes and, and I still had a few. We kind of put that together. Um, did okay with that. 2015, unfortunate part, I go through a divorce. Mm. Terrible worst thing ever in the entire world you could go through, right? So I go through this divorce. Um, Are you letting deals fall through the cracks because you don't have good systems in place? We've been there before and we've tried several different CRMs and Ari Simply has been the best. Ari Simply tracks your KPIs, does automatic follow-ups for you, and even records your incoming phone calls. The system is simple to use and has more features than we even know what to do with. If you're looking for a great CRM, try RE Simply today. We put the link in the description. Check it out now. And at that particular time, I knew that I, I loved real estate. I earned my money. I earned my money in car dealerships. Mm -hmm. I invested in real estate, mm -hmm. right? Um, so when I when I left Rormans at that particular time, I was like, you know, let's. Uh, uh, there was a, there was a stint there. I did some IT stuff, uh, automotive IT stuff, um, made respectable money. Um, but I said, you know, let's get back into automotive. So I leased the current location on Lima Road. Um, at that particular time, I had four partners. There were four of us. Wow! In that little store, partners. It was myself. It was Gary Hamilton, and Kyle Borrier, and then it was um, Dana Wright, which was Gary's now Gary's wife. Mm. We gave her ten percent. Um, 
just to kind of come in. So the rest of us were a third, third, third. So we were 30, 30% three ways plus the 10. We came in, we started making some pretty good money. I mean, I don't know. Again, not yet. We're, we're, we weren't really making a ton of money. Uh, the conflict that we had is that the everybody had been my employee prior. Mm-hmm. And they were adamant about, I mean, adamant that, just so you know, you're not in charge. <laughs> and so I was very reluctant uh, make decisions. to make a firm decision. Mm-hmm. Um, instead, I, I would always defer back to them. Well, what do you think? Yeah. The decisions that we made, not as a collective, I went with it, Mm -hmm. but they were not good decisions. Mm -hmm. So within a period of time, Gary and Dana, they want to, they want to buy out, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and at that time, there was really nothing to buy out. Mm -hmm. Like there was, it was worth nothing. Mm -hmm. So they decide they want to buy out. I buy them out and they travel the country, live in a couple of different places and they leave. And then that leaves Kyle and myself. How much was the buyout? $50,000. $50,000. Wow. But but if you look at it from an asset standpoint of view, I mean, yeah, what know. are you buying? Right. We didn't own those cars. We owned a couple of the cars, right. but like, you it's know. It's all leveraged and. Yeah. And, and, and so the thing is, is like the philosophy was if you want to make more money, raise your prices. And it's like, I already know that doesn't work. Mm-hmm. Lower your prices, sell more volume. Right. You know, and, and work and go work the deal. And yep. so we buy them out. They leave. Um, man, this is a crazy one. Uh, at this particular time, it was, it was Kyle and myself. And we really started rocking. I mean, we're doing it right. We're, we're doing the volume. We're doing all those things. And um, wow, this is a crazy one. But uh Kyle, in between working with me at a dealership to partnering with me at a store, goes to prison. Oh, gosh. Yeah. So he had hooked up with a shady individual, and they were in this game of selling spice. Mm. Yeah. And but they were doing it not at a street hustle type level. They had a manufacturing facility. They had attorney firms. And, you know, what I've made bits and pieces of that kind of come together, what I've, what I've, what I've you know, processed on my own is that they were trying to stay, like, one step ahead of the law. Wow. And so I guess the Indiana, which I knew nothing about, had nothing to do with, but the Indiana government was saying, okay, this, this compound— K2 was yeah, K2. Yeah. yeah. I remember when they got popular for like three or four years. Yeah. And so what they were doing, they had Snoop Dogg as a spokesman for their product. <laughs> so that lets you know how big it got, yeah. right? Holy crap. Uh, they were doing cameos with Snoop. And, and, and so they had this facility and, and they were getting these like, they were getting this like molecular structure and they were sending it into the state and saying, they're like, oh, that's this legal. Is what we're going to sell. So then they would, they would, you know, they thought they were way ahead of the law because they were taking this and they were making these products and then they were putting not for human consumption, but let there be no doubt. Right, they knew. They knew. Yeah. Okay. And then what they did is they took automotive people, good salespeople, good phone process, good skills. They set up call centers and they were like distributing this countrywide. Wow. To, to like a lot of BP. Gas like stations. Gas, yeah. yeah. Yep. And so, so they were doing this. And, of course, you know, Kyle at the time wasn't an owner. He just worked for the guy. Mm-hmm. But he was, like, the vice president. Mm. So apparently, you know, that I find out that um, – um, so I find out that there was this guy apparently in Texas that was a main supplier of bringing in the chemical compound, and he had gotten busted by FBI, DA. Or DA and so what they did is they – they, they mic'd him up, and they just waited. And so what they did is Kyle, my previous business partner, was at a trade show. Um, and so Barry Bay is the owner of this particular company. I think he's serving like 70 years or 80 years Holy now, right crap. now. So Barry called this guy and said, hey, you know, we're out of the product. I need this. And the guy goes, well, I don't have that, but I got this. And it was a banned substance. It was a banned controlled substance. So what they did is the guy was 
giving states evidence, you will. And so what they did is they sent in the chemical, sent it to Barry. They processed it, which, by the way, the processing on this is, which I find out later, is basically you buy smokable potpourri and you get a big mixing bowl and you throw in so much potpourri and you sprinkle the dust on it. And you just like mix it up and then put it in there. So not exactly, not exactly structured, <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> So, so they, they get arrested. They end up arresting everybody. I'm at the dealership one day. And we're, you know, when we say dealership, we're talking about like a small store, right? And it's Lime Road Auto Brokers. And, and they come in and, and Kyle goes to jail. He's gone, right? Wow. Uh, Kyle comes back like a week later. I'm like, what is going on here? Like, yeah. So then I get the whole story. Um, but my loyalty is a big thing. And, and Kyle's a good person, and, and I don't know that, you know, whether he did or whether he didn't. I find it hard to believe he didn't know some bad stuff going on, but, you know, he obviously probably honestly felt that what they were doing was legal, but yeah. still not like morally right. right. Still not morally right. Just because something's legal doesn't make it morally right, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Um, so Kyle does a prison stat. I'm going through a divorce at the time, and I'm like, what do I do, right? Mm -hmm. So... Um, I, I've got to, you know, take care of the financial side of my divorce. I'm doomed. I'm like, it's the worst time of my life. How much did you have to give up on that? Did they just take all your assets or money or like, Oh no. They... So they had nothing to do the finance. So the, as far as the business had nothing to do with any type of legal because everything, I mean, we started the business with $60,000, right? Right. We're leasing a building. Mm -hmm. There's nothing here There's that's no unethical or, or immoral. So mm -hmm. I went to Kyle and I, Kyle said he was going to prison and he's like, Hey, you can buy me out. You know, just give me the 20 grand back and buy me out. Yeah. I said, no, I'm not done here. And so I said, but I can't be your partner. Mm -hmm. I'll be your wife's partner, but I can't do anything with you, man. Mm -hmm. So his wife, Nadia, became my partner. So as she became my partner, he's in prison, and he's in prison at the time. Everything, every dollar I take from the business, she's a nurse, by the way, because they have young children, so she gets to keep her health insurance. So every dollar I take, she gets a check. Mm -hmm. But I'm doing all the work, mm -hmm. right? So I hook up with Tim Duncan, who owned a small store in New Haven, and great guy. And, you know, obviously Tim and I were like, what? What is going on here? So we, Tim and I decided to partner up and buy the old Fort Wayne Foundry building location where Big, City's cur current car Big City Cars currently is. Okay. And we actually bring Kyle's wife on the ride. We're 33 and a third three ways. Wow. So we have to stick their investment in to build this new facility. So we're, you know, we do a prom note we're, we're you know, mm -hmm. we bring them in. Kyle gets out of prison in two years and walks into a multi-million dollar business. Wow. And all he wanted was 20,000 to start. Right. So unfortunately that business didn't work out with all of us. So we bought him out. Mm -hmm. uh, he now owns his own store up in Auburn. And so we wish him nothing but the best of luck. Since then, we've grown exponentially. And, and, and that's kind of like, that's where the run really got going. That's where the run really started to happen. Yep. That's crazy. Yeah. That's funny because uh, we had a very similar thing happen with a lot of what we did whenever we were building the businesses. Like one guy we bought out and then Tony wanted to not be in. And so like we did a lot of stuff where like, all right, you're staying in. And yeah. uh, it was very similar, so that's crazy. You said a lot there. It's funny because I had a list of questions and you basically <laughs> went through almost all of my questions that I was gonna ask you. Oh, I got on a rant. <laughs> yeah, so that rant. is kind of funny, but no, that's good because now we don't have to ask the questions and you went through them all. I wanna point out a couple things that you said there that's gonna be, sure. I, I think, important for the listeners because, and then I have a question about one, but one is gonna be that uh, I think a lot of times people will try to maximize on every single deal or every property. Whereas you saw that like even on your personal house, yeah, I took a hit, but you were trying to maximize on the property. You're trying to maximize on like the life or like the direction that you wanted to go. And so I think that's really important because Tony and I have lost uh, $40,000 on a property before and everybody thought we were crazy because guess what? We could have made that deal profitable. We could have- Like, yeah, put, you should have lease optioned it and then yep. you should have sold it for more then you should have, you know, charged this percent interest, and then you could have sold it on the secondary market to a, a note buyer, and like, 
Yeah. So we could have done that and we would have made money on that deal. So it's possible that we would have, but what we look at is like, okay, while we lost $40,000, we still were getting a hundred grand back because we didn't over leverage on it. So then it's like, can we take that money and go and make more money with it? And so then again, I think that's a good reminder for people not to try to maximize or not lose money on every deal. Cause that's your ego at that point. That's and so, ego. Yeah. Ego. Yeah. Well, ego is the biggest, ego is absolutely the biggest strain mm -hmm. that you could you could come in with right yep. um ego is ego has no place and and ego is terrible in the car business and and, and dakota you know this it, ego kills dealerships because it's so blatantly obvious it's in your face because mm -hmm. the ego is in your face every time you go to the sales just what's wrong with you you weak you need mm -hmm. me to close this and then the, the ego mm -hmm. destroys dealerships it really really does but it, it, and we see it in dealerships because it's so obvious it's in your face. But it, in in any type of business, ego is the worst thing that you can do, mm -hmm. right? There's many times that you can go, and I've experienced this personally, where I can go in and negotiate with someone, and it's a tough negotiation, and 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 people get they get upset, like mm -hmm. you know, how could you offer me that? Like mm -hmm. you're trying to steal from me, or this or that, or whatever the case may be. But that's where that's where you don't want to show an ego side mm -hmm. you just want to educate and 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 you always want to end the negotiation with hey i really want to put a deal together right 100%. right if you're not ending that regardless of what aspect of business is if you're not ending it on a happy note of i really i really hope we can put something together yep then that's just ego and yep. i've seen it with sales managers that go in want to work a deal with a customer okay and, and you're asking $20,000 for the car, and the guy says, I'll give you 10 cash. Mm -hmm. And we know that you, know, you don't have 100% markup. Not it's not gonna happen. <laughs> but but I've, I've, witnessed, I've witnessed sales managers go in and talk to this particular customer, and they're like, where'd you get your number at? Like, are you educated at all? I mean, if you're gonna offer me 10, why didn't you say eight? If we're gonna talk stupid, let's talk real stupid. <laughs> right. And that's ego, that customer leaves and never comes back. Mm -hmm. Whereas you're like, hey, I really want to put this together for you. I really, really do. But I think we're a little far apart. You know, Sh can you share with me where you came up with that? Because maybe they did. Maybe they didn't. Right. Mm -hmm. Maybe they found the car like that on the Internet that's in Muncie, Indiana. And, 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 they, and, and by being respectful and not letting ego, you can say, show me where you're coming up with that. And they're like, oh, I found this one in Muncie. It's pretty simple. You're going to take that VIN number, go run a Carfax and be like, folks, you could buy that car. But by the way, it's a total loss. It's been in a flood. Mm -hmm. Right. And, 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 and so yeah, ego is, their ego is, too, ego yeah. is a bad deal. Ego is, if there's anything you need to get rid of, it's ego, yeah. humble yourself and get rid of the ego. Yeah. Well, ego, ego, I've definitely noticed in the car business is actually what holds people and keeps them where they're at. I've seen a lot of people who make a lot of money. Um, and they don't have any money because their ego. They also think that they've now arrived because they're making a couple hundred thousand dollars. It's like, dude, you haven't arrived. And then, yeah, ego is definitely an interesting thing, but it definitely holds people back. I see it the most in the car business because people go from working the trailer mm -hmm. factory, working labor to making a substantial amount of money. And now they think that they're better than everybody else. And it's like, dude, you got a, you had an opportunity that you were given and then you took advantage of that opportunity. You're like, everybody else could do the same thing, but people don't think about it like that. Um, one other question I did want to ask you about is you said that people are financially dumb. And so I always think that's interesting is because like, it's like, it's not actually smart. People think that the people who are rich are smart when a lot of times it's not necessarily smart. It's actually, it's actually stopping your ego and then your like, uh, your, um, mm. self-control. So I just wanted to see like, uh, if you just label it like that, or you think it actually does have to do with intelligence at all? It, it has nothing to do with intelligence. Um, I know a lot of really dumb multi-millionaires yep. okay yep. um there's a lot of people out there way smarter than me no no doubt about it um we can talk about college education smart mm -hmm. there's there's different types of smartness right um but i was i was just financially dumb and so many people are and you know we we've got this we've been we've been instilled with this this thing since birth okay and and it's it's pretty simple it's it's it takes money to make money mm -hmm. No, it doesn't. It doesn't take money to make money, right? Yeah. It doesn't. But what it takes is, is it takes commitment. It takes 
it takes a strategy, it takes a plan, and, and, and those strategies and plans change all the time. I mean, we've got a bob and weave and everything else, but so many of these guys, you know, like, like you said, they start making six figures, and the next thing you hear is like, you know, see my Rolex? Yep. Hey, I uh, bought a new Harley. Yep. I, I got this, right? And you're like, yeah, but um, did you pay off that 30000 in credit card debt? Right. And it, it's just... It's, it's there, too. Like, people think that's a joke, like, man... Yeah, that's it's dumb. Yeah, a lot it's, of people do that. It's dumb. I've, I've fi- I have personally been in the finance, and so the hierarchy of a dealership is the salesperson, then the finance manager, then the sales manager, general sales manager. But I have personally done finance contracts where people above me in the organization organization have purchased vehicles. Yeah. So I get to see their credit report, right. which is good, right? Yeah. Some people, you wouldn't believe how many guys are making well over yep. six figures and have terrible credit. That's number one. Yep. But then number two is, is you're looking at their credit report and going, wow, look how much this guy's got going out a month. Yeah, it's crazy. It's insane. It's just dumb. When I stopped being financially dumb, I finally bought my house. Um, I, I, I had already started saving in that process, excuse me. But when I bought my house, it was like 50000 And my goal was, um, you know, we, we talk about this at like Grant Cardone, right? Like, mm-hmm. so... Um, what I realized is in the first beginning stages of not being financially dumb, my objective was get rid of the money. Mm-hmm. If you don't have it, you can't spend it, mm-hmm. right? So as I was getting those monthly checks, I'm like, okay, what can I buy that will either be an investment to make more money? I could buy something and sell it, whether it's a home or it's a car, or it's a motorcycle, whatever. I was looking to take that money and grow it. Mm-hmm. And it was in many different ways. Yep. Like back in the day, we didn't have Facebook Marketplace. We had we had Craigslist. Mm-hmm. So I'm looking on Craigslist. Well, what can I buy? I bought an entire semi load of hot water heaters one time. Oh my gosh. But I was I, I bought the entire semi load of hot water heaters for 45 bucks a piece. Well, wow. And then you're like, oh man, now I gotta buy a place so that I can put all these <laughs> stuff. So, yeah. So I take these hot water heaters and I'm selling them for like 150 bucks. But I'm I mean I Yeah. And, and I'm, it, it was an investment. And so that's kind of not being financially dumb. I'm like, what can I do with the money yep. to try and get more of it back? Yep. If it's not just sitting there, that's where that's where you get a little sticky, especially if you've got a little bit of ego. And I do have some. Right. I Everybody's got to have some. I try and bring it down a notch. But, um, you know, my thing was, what can I do with the money to make a little more money? Yep. Dude, that's the funny thing about salespeople and people who are successful is like you have to have an ego, but you also have to be willing to like set it aside and like continue that fight because like uh, ego also helps you to stand up for yourself when things are unfair and like actually tell your perspective, hey, that that ten thousand dollars that you offered me, that's actually a whole lot less than what I even bought it for, so it doesn't make sense for me to do that. But like you have to be willing to stand up for yourself and like have that balance, but never let it get out of control, which is it's a fine line. It's a fine line of tact. Yeah, it's all about the tact. You know, it's, it's a fine line on tact and you can't teach it. Mm-hmm. You, you'll learn it when you, right. when you you'll, <laughs> you'll learn, learn it, it and you will learn it the hard way. Yeah. hundred percent. Right? You will learn it the hard way. And we all have everybody, every, everybody that I talk to that has humbled themselves and said, okay, then you kind of learn it. You, yep. you start to learn that like, man, that didn't work. Yep. You got to find a different avenue. Yep. I mm-hmm. see, um, I see Bobby. I don't know if you had the same thought, Dakota, when you look at Bobby. I see Bobby as the, uh, have you seen the founder? founder. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, McDonald's? Is yeah. that the yeah, McDonald's yeah. one? Okay, yeah. The, the actor that plays him does a really good job, and uh, he's just, like, obsessed with getting this restaurant to work. And so I see you being that person when you first started the dealership because you're just, like, you're, like, imagining where it's going to be and that sort of thing. Like, you've got that energy about you where you're like, I can see it. I know that's going to happen. I just got to I, I got to figure out how to buy it. Well, you know, and, and, and that's true, right? So in so many different avenues of business and life, just like we were talking about the guy that says, I drive, you know, I drive this mm-hmm. and my kid's going to drive this. And and what happens is, is, is tough times create strong men and strong men create easy times, which mm-hmm. create weak men Mm -hmm. that whole you've seen that and heard that and Mm -hmm. it's and and what it is is i think in social media and marketing and videos and 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 podcasts what happens is when we start to see certain things facebook delivers for example they deliver Mm -hmm. this stuff that oh you watched that whole video great you must be Mm -hmm. into hunting let me send you all these hunting Mm -hmm. videos and so what happens is you were able to see that you knew exactly what i was talking about when i said it and it's because 
as we get there, we start to see that same stuff. And so when you just brought up the fact that I can visually see that dealership and so on, I did. Mm -hmm. So so I'm leasing this building for auto brokers, okay? Bill Holwick, one of my dearest oh, yeah. friends, was a sales manager at Don Ayers right next door to our dealership, right? Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget it. One day, one day Bill calls me and he says, so... <laughs> So, um, um, so I heard you're going to like buy that foundry place over there and build this new store for a few million dollars. And I'm like, yeah. He's like, what? And I'm like, yeah. Well, when's that going to happen? I said, I don't know, but it's going to happen. Right. So that was the whole visual part of it. Yeah. Like. I started telling people what I was going to do before I even have it figured out. I'd never yeah. even made an offer. I don't even know if the land's for sale. <laughs> but I'm telling people, I'm going to build a new store. Yeah, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do this. And, you know, here we are. You know, I was blessed with one of the best business partners out there that you could ever have that we we, we mesh real well. And, and I gave him the vision and said, this is what I'm going to do. And he says, his, his exact response, Tim Duncan looks at me and goes, well, how are we going to do it? <laughs> and I was like, yeah guy who gets the vision right so yep. you do have to see it like if if you don't know where you're going or what you're doing or you don't even have a vision of what it's going to be it'll never be right you can't see it yep that's awesome <laughs> you, you don't see a clear path you never will yep but like if you don't see it it isn't going to happen yep mm -hmm. all right well, man i got a couple more questions Shoot. i want to get into because uh we got maybe another i don't know we might go a little long here but uh i want to know from you uh we kind of already touched on a little bit but in your opinion, what makes a good salesperson? Oh, wow. Good salesperson. A good listener. From Kendallville. Yeah. <laughs> you got to be from Noble County. Yeah. Uh, good listener. Um, no, you got to be a, a, a listener, right? Mm -hmm. um, the problem, you know, there's two things that people can smell in the world. It's a wet dog and a hungry salesman, mm. right? The key to being in sales and to being a good salesperson is not being a salesperson. Mm -hmm. It isn't. Like, it's amazing how many calls that I receive where people are trying to sell me stuff. And, you know, I'll flip the script on them. And it's quite simple. It's like, hey, you know, no problem. You know what, Tony, I I'm glad you called me today about this, these new floor scrubbers. But before I get into it, can you tell me what type of car you currently drive? <laughs> and Tony's like, oh, I drive a Honda Accord. Tony, great. <laughs> By the way, Tony, let me ask you this. Are you like the rest of us in the world still making payments? Or are you one of those lucky ones that has it paid off? Well, you know, I'm still making payments. Great, Tony. Let me ask you a question. If I can get you into a nicer, newer car and keep your payments relatively the same, would you at least consider it? That's a salesperson just being a salesperson. Right. Mm. It's 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 creepy. It's crawly yeah, and everything right. else. So when you really want to be a good salesperson, don't come off as a salesperson. Yeah. Listen to the customer. Listen more than you talk, mm -hmm. and then offer a solution. Mm -hmm. Right. It's about getting a solution, and. If you can listen way more than you talk, and they, and if you do that, when you're giving out that information, they will listen way more closely than they ever thought if you just keep rambling. 100%. You know? Because hey, you're also saying what they just talked about, actually. Mm -hmm. All you're doing is telling the solution to everything that they just said, so now they're actually listening because they just said everything that you're trying to help them with. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you, you listen to some of the best guys out there in the world, right? Um, Cardone's really good with it. Um, you know, what we're doing is, is we, we listen to the client. And then what you want to do is you want to repeat it back. Like, hey, mm -hmm. Tony, if I heard you right, you know, if I heard you right, you're saying that you're having troubles with this, 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 mm -hmm. right? Just go into these sales modules that are available in the world today, almost anybody, and when you repeat it back to the customer, they know you're listening and they know you care. Now you got to find a solution. Yep. That's it. That's a salesperson, right? That's being a great salesperson is really listening. Yeah. The funny thing is I've, uh, I came to a new question because, you know, even Grant Cardone and everybody, like they give you certain, uh, um, you can bring it on the table if you want, um, but they bring certain, um, like they do bring that sales pitch kind of. And then what I've always noticed is that something that I did differently was I was just genuine. And then like sometimes I'd be like, all right, don't tell my manager that I'm doing this or anything. Cause I would legitimately do stuff that you're not supposed to do because like, yeah, I was being too genuine stuff, but that's what worked is because people could tell like, dude, this guy is being legitimate. And then now what I've been doing is like, it's actually helped me in relationships and understand people more and just have empathy. I'm like, when you say 
you know, these words, what do you mean by that? And then they just elaborate on it because I'm, I'm trying to understand what they're trying to accomplish yeah. better so I can actually help them with the solution. Yeah. And, th and that's, you're spot on. I mean, listening, just listen and listen and ask the right questions mm -hmm. about what they're telling you. Yep. 90% of the time they'll tell you what it takes to put a deal 100%. together. While I love a lot of like the Cardone stuff, the, what I don't like is the roboticness, yeah. right? Don't be a robot. Don't be a, well, if I can get you into this car and keep your yeah. payments roll. I mean, that's, you know, you can do this in your radio yeah. voice a thousand times, but like you're coming off like a salesperson. Yeah. Whoa. But if you can just talk to people like a normal human being and so many people in the business don't do it. Dakota, mm -hmm. you know that. Like, yeah. um, you know, I always tell for years, I've always told everybody in training is that I'm going to give you everything I have. It may not work for you. So take what does and mm -hmm. throw away the rest. It doesn't matter. Yep. There's no there's no clear path of if you do this, 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 right. you will sell. Yeah. Everybody's doesn't got happen. Their, yeah, everybody's got their different styles too, which is funny. Some people make jokes. Some people like get them to laugh and get mm -hmm. excited. Some people are just like really understanding, empathetic. Some like it's just all these different styles. Some people are just aggressive. Like Grant, Matt McKibben, dude, he's aggressive and he's a freaking animal at it though like he's he's actually he knows how to do it in a, a way that's pushy but then also still respectful he's still listening and he actually gets people good deals so it's it's an interesting way that people can sell a lot differently uh, matt mckibben is by matt mckibben is by far right if i were going to go on the sales floor yeah and, and i've been around the country i've been you know i've worked in st louis and indianapolis and some of the biggest dealer groups in, in the in the country um matt mckibben is by far one of the best in the country yeah i said i put him Bar against grant cardone i will cardone. put i'll put matt mckibben up against anyone yeah. right because of his style mm -hmm. because of his style he can apply pressure in a way that's non-invasive yep. that is non-confrontational yeah and he does it with a joke and a laugh I know. I don't right know how he does it oh. and, and you're just like wow where did he come up with that right yeah. and and I've always admired him and, and his style and uniqueness, you know, I'd put him up with at the best in the country, period. I said the same thing, too. I said, I was like, dude, I literally think he's a better salesperson than anybody. That's why I'm like, I want to get him on the podcast, too. But he is in. I've never seen him. He sold 52 cars one month. And like when he came over to Hyundai, that was when I lost <laughs> my streak. Yeah, it's not, yeah. At, not at like a big, not at a big dealership, like at a, a dealership that sells like 75 cars a month. So he's got like you know, half the volume of most dealerships. And but, but people think that, okay, well, you know, he was getting all the good leads. He was getting this. And 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 you he know was, it. He was taking, so I will say he was taking some because <laughs> I, yeah. 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 I found out that he logged in and then I called him out for it. And I was like, bro, this is bull crap. And then we got him to stop. But regardless, he sold probably 35 of them out of the service, service department. Yeah. <laughs> so I watched yes. him sell 35. So regardless, he was going to beat me. Yeah. And then the other 15 to 20 were from, from stealing them. But still. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that's Matt. Um, it's amazing because, like, he'll go on the service drive. Someone's there to get an oil change. They've only had their car for a year. Yeah. And he's like, but did you see the color of this new one I have? Yeah. Like, and he's, it, it, it's it's outstanding. It, it, it is. It yeah, is. and he is. And the crazy part is, he's a genuine guy too. Like he's actually genuine when you talk to him. He's like, dang. Like he actually he does get him good deals too. Like he gives the cars away, honestly. But like he he works a deal and he's like really trying to find out how to help him. So yeah, I I, I really respect him a lot. Um, what do you look for whenever you're choosing a uh, a leader to run your dealerships? I've wow wow I've I've not been the best at that. <laughs> Um, I have not been the best at that. Um, when I, when I'm looking for somebody, well, we, we do know somebody that you hired, so yeah, 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 yeah. so no, we know, we know you're not the best at that. I'm not, I'm not the best at that. Um, well, what would you say are like the mistakes and the good things and like, what would you do differently now or moving forward then? Like, um, you know, okay. So what I did wrong back then is I, I, I was I was looking I was looking for someone that had experience, mm -hmm. right? Which which is a plus. That had the experience that 
that could come in and like you know make these make make these great things. Um, and and I, I was looking more for people that I knew, people that I knew that had the reputation and the history of being in the business. And you can't be in the business for twenty years and not know what you're doing, right? right. Um, and I don't want to say they didn't know what they were doing. But the problem with that, the problem that I had in the past is we know what works, mm -hmm. okay? So follow up, making your calls, making your contacts. I know it stinks. Mm -hmm. I know it's a pain in the rear. It, it, it isn't in a perfect world, but nothing in marketing has ever worked as good as follow up, mm -hmm. period. Mm -hmm. You may follow up with one guy for six months and he never buys a car, but all of a sudden he sends in his buddy Charlie yep. that he works on the assembly line with and, and there you are because you stayed in contact. Yep. And so, my, my problem that I had in previous selections is people that didn't believe in the process, mm. right? They didn't believe in the process. And so I'm saying everyone needs to do this, hit a minimum quota of how many points of contact. And they kind of were like going, you know, behind my back and be like, yeah, it's not that big of a deal, whatever. You don't have to make those calls. Mm. Now I look for process driven people, right? Mm -hmm. And and it, you don't have to be the best, you don't have to be the greatest. I'm looking about can you follow a process? Mm -hmm. Our process works. Yeah. It's evident, right? Yep. Our process works and so I'm looking for people that that number one is I want you to lower your ego. Um lower the ego and follow a process. And and, and make sure that I don't care that you've been in the business as long as I have, okay? You don't know everything, and neither do I. Mm -hmm. It the every industry and business is constantly changing. And when you stop learning and you stop changing, yeah. it's when the business dies. Uh, I've got Micah Dillian with me. He's our director of operations, and one of the one of the greatest things he ever said. And and we're you know we we spent months and months together before I hired him, mm -hmm. right? And I've known him. He used to work with me at at, at Toy Lexus Kia, but. One of the things he told me, and I was like, you get it. He said, negative always goes up and never goes down. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, if you're a sales manager and you've got a big complaint and you don't, you're mad about this, don't go and gripe to your salespeople that are below you. Mm. You bring that to me. When you bring it to me, if I'm not happy about the situation, I'm gonna take it to the owner. Mm -hmm. And that was amazing. I was like, wow, that's right. Mm -hmm. So gripe, but, but a lot of people in, in whatever industry you're in, you're like, yeah, I don't wanna tell my boss I'm unhappy. Yep. I don't wanna do, I don't wanna tell my boss that. Instead, I'm gonna go over there to either my A, my counterparts, or people who work for me, and I'm gonna go over there and I'm gonna complain, and I'm gonna do this. Mm. Well, the problem never gets so, fixed. Yeah. And it only gets worse. Yep. And now it's spread, mm. you know, negative. And so when he told me that, I was like, man, that's pretty powerful. I'm going to keep that one. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Negative up and positive down. It's the only way it works. Yeah. Yeah, that'll change an environment quick. That's actually what I tell everybody who works with us uh, now. I'm like, hey, guys, if you are unhappy, that's okay. You can leave. Like, don't stay here because honestly, you're not doing us a service and you're not doing yourself a service. Like, if you're not happy here and as you're not aligned with our vision, there's going to be no hard feelings. I will not be upset with you. I will be upset with you if you stay here and then you just continue to be upset with your life. Like, I don't want you to do that. I don't want anybody to do that because we want people who are visions aligned and are going to the same place. And like, we'll make sure that we're going to get there. You are who you surround yourself by. Yeah. 100%. I mean, you've heard it before, right? You want to know where you're going? Show me your five best friends. Yep. True. Yeah. True story. Yeah. I like it. Well, you want to get into closing questions now? Sure. <laughs> Which ones? <laughs> oh, man. Whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's your biggest struggle right now, Bobby? <sighs> it's not receiving residual income from not knowing getting a, tw uh, a good return on your money from LTD property group. That's not <laughs> yeah. part of yeah. Okay. I must say great return <laughs> and quick. Right. And uh, Johnny on the spot, like it was um, quicker and uh, very lucrative. Um, but the uh, biggest problem right now is the unknown, mm -hmm. right? Like, and, and, and 
for me, this is on a personal level where, you know, I, I watch a lot of other podcasts and things and people talk about it. And, and, um, I don't know if you've heard about the hot dog vendor, right? Uh, yeah. so hot dog guy, he's got a cart. He's got a hot dog cart. He's selling tons of hot dogs, right? He sends his son to Harvard. Okay. Well, then the guy gets a, the second one and I mean, he's all beef hot dogs. The guy's doing great. He gets another one. He gets another one. Next thing you know, he's got 30 of them, right? Mm. Son comes back from Harvard and says, dad, I know you're doing well and everything, but we're in a recession. What we have to do is we have to we we have to change that hot dog and we need to go with this cheaper one. We're gonna make more money, we're gonna save money, let's flip it to this. So they flip this hot dog, they do it over like 30 carts, everything else. Well, business starts getting really bad. He goes from 30 to 20 to 15 to 10, down to two. He's got two hot dog carts left, and the dad looks over his son and he goes, I guess you're right, we're in a recession. Mm. The fact of the matter is he was never in a recession. Right. During that recession, he was doing great, right? Mm -hmm. And and it's all about that thinking. And mm -hmm. and my biggest hurdle is so many businesses right now are still flourishing. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. But mine, I personally struggle every single day of sitting back and going, okay, um, what's gonna happen? Mm -hmm. Are we gonna be good? Are we gonna be bad? Should I should I are, are car values it. going to drop drastically as high as they went up? Okay, so I should decrease my inventory, right? right? And I'm always looking at, like, those aspects where I needed to say, you know what? I'm not in a recession. Right now, today, yep. I already beat last year's numbers and the, the year's numbers before for the month of December. Yep. Right? I've already beat them. Yep. So we're supposed to be in this recession. My problem is, is to maintain my thought process of saying... I'm not in a recession. Mm -hmm. People are. I'm not. Yep. And that's the problem. Once we start getting in that ditch of, I'm in this recession and I'm in this bad and I better, I better save all this money and not do anything and not invest it and not do this. Well, we just put ourselves in a recession. Yeah. 100%. So that's my biggest hurdle. Dude, we must be we must be from the same town or something because uh, <laughs> the funny thing is I literally just had this conversation with our team actually in this room and I said, hey guys. You're probably hearing that we're in a recession and that like, you know, house values are going down and stuff. Just so you guys know, we buy based on margin. And I remember this in sales all the time. It'd be winter time. And you know what everybody says? Winter time is going to be slow, guys. Well, guess what? I sold the same amount of cars in the winter as I did every other month. It did not matter for me. So it's all no about the doubt. mindset. And so I'm like, dude, you guys can slow down. I'm going to stay on it because the funny thing is, as soon as you tell yourself that, you do create that because then guess what? You tell yourself it's going to be slow. You know what you do? You stop going out there and getting the ups because it's already going to be slow. So now you don't get them. But if I tell myself I'm going to do the same no matter what, dude, I did the same no matter what. So it is about what you tell yourself. It is important to keep in mind, like I always heard the, the saying, you can go broke buying good deals. So you have to keep that in the back of your mind and like not over leverage, not overdo it at the same time. But at the same time, finding that balance and like letting yourself know that while everybody else can be in a recession, you don't have to be. And I've noticed that from being in a dealership is like, dude, I'm selling cars and nobody else is. And that's OK. That is kind of funny, too, because it. it it's almost like I I remember Grant Cardone saying something kind of cool about this, but then also you got to look at like what he did at the beginning of COVID, which was like <laughs> fire everybody, oh, yeah, stock yeah, distributions. Yeah, yeah. Like he panicked, and then he looked a little bit like uh, I think he did the right thing at the time, but like he did look like a little bit of an idiot because he like went way too hard to like try to make sure that like he was safe and that he wasn't going to go under, but. Grant was really funny. Uh, I've watched a lot of his videos, and he's just like, oh, we're in a recession, huh? Well, it's time for me to buy up a bunch of market share. Like, I can't wait yeah. to, like, to to pass everybody else when everybody decides to take their foot off the gas because, mm -hmm. like, now's, now's the time to gain market share and make my business, like, one of the few businesses because all these other ones are going out of business. Mm -hmm. so. That's like when COVID, exactly. When COVID first hit, when COVID first hit, Everybody kind of went, oh, yep. what, what are we doing? And yep. dealers, whether big or small, said, get those cars to the auction, yeah. right? Yep. The first thing I did, wrong thing, is I went ahead and went to the internet and I priced every car at dead cost because I said, you know what? If if the world is going to shut down, I don't want an inventory. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. What I should have done is said, go to the auction and buy all these cars. Right, buy them for cars cheap. were selling for half of what they were worth yeah. the day before. Yep. And within 30 to 45 days, they went up 25% of the original. So you could have spent 10 grand and gotten 30 out of it. Yep. And so we missed an opportunity, right? right? And 
it, you know, I, I look at it and say, you know, I look at it and say, you know, if it's the end of the world on the financial sector or whatever, whatever realm you're in, well, we're all, we're all going down anyway. Exactly. We're all going down anyway. That's exactly right? what I said. Yep. It is kind of funny. It seems like all of the folks from out of state now, like before we were like, oh, it seems like some folks from out of state are starting to buy in Fort Wayne. Now it seems like even more folks from out of state are like, yep. you know what makes sense? Buying somewhere where there's not as much depreciation yep. and so, or appreciation and depreciation. There's not volatility mm -hmm. and a variety of prices. You know, there's no up and down. It's more flat line in the Midwest. And I think a lot of folks from out of state now are like, okay, well, now that we're in a recession, it's time to take this half a million dollars and buy like five properties or something. Yep. I've sold a few homes um, over the last year and a half or so. I've sold a, a few homes and it was crazy. They were investors from out of state. Yep. Never even saw the house. Yep. And they're buying them and it's because of the market that we're in. It's a very stable market. It yep. really is a stable market compared to many places in the United 100%. States. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the, and even if it does go down 20%, we're talking okay, that's 20 to $40,000. Like it's not that big of a deal. It'll be fine. And it still cash flows or will break even. Yeah, when you're buying in Phoenix, Vegas, California, I mean, they're taking massive hits and they're all freaking out right now like we're yeah, friends 100 with a lot to, of them. 100 to 300,000 hits. I I've, I've got a I've got a I got a quick one for you. Um so I'm currently looking for a home in Fort Myers, right? Yep. Why? Well, it's an opportunity, right? Yep. So, so what I'm doing is, is I'm looking, I'm working with a realtor down there and I'm looking at these homes and I'm like, okay, now's the time. I mean, because Fort Myers is decimated. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I say decimated, it's unbelievable. And you could look Google Earth and check it out. It's, it's, it's decimated. So what I'm doing is, is I'm looking on uh, realtor.com and I'm pulling up these houses. What I'm doing is I'm taking the address and I'm putting them into Zillow, mm -hmm. right? So I'm looking at it and I'm like scratching my head and I got it. This isn't making any sense. I'm not the smartest guy. I never will claim to be, but this doesn't make sense. So I'm looking at this house on Zillow and it's, you know, it's, it's a million two. Or I'm, I'm sorry, I'm looking at realtor and the list price currently is a million two. Mm -hmm. So what they do in all these homes, if you check realtor.com, they have all of the previous photos of what it did look like. Oh uh, yeah. And then what they've done is they've done the water remediation. They removed all the drywall and all that. And, and they're showing, here's what it looks like now. Mm. Okay. And they're destroyed. Some of them don't have windows and doors. Some of them have, they, they just tore the whole house down because the local engineers are coming in and saying, nope, it's got to be tore down. Oh, wow. Yeah. So you before you can rebuild or before you can start your construction work, the engineer has to come in and say, okay, this foundation, this everything's sturdy. You're good. You're good to put it back together. So I'm looking at these homes and they're like 1.2 million. I'm like, okay, all right, all right. Now let's see what kind of deal there is because there's no drywall. I mean, at all in the whole house, windows are gone, the pool is destroyed. I mean, this hundreds of thousands of dollars of damage. And so I'm like, all right, let's see what a deal is. What was it worth? And I know Zillow is just a guide. It's the right. same thing as Kelly Blue Book yeah, yeah. in the auto industry, right? Yep. But it's it'll give you a guide. Yeah. So I'm looking at the guide on Zillow and I'm like, wait, two months prior to Hurricane Ian, it was worth 750,000. Tell me how a house that had a rough estimate of seven hundred fifty thousand is now worth one point two million. Because there's there's less supply. <laughs> but you you got to think. I mean, there is less supply. <laughs> I got wiped but, out. But this house is destroyed, right? Yeah. And and I'm talking to the the realtor, and I'm like, this doesn't make any sense. And she goes, exactly. Let me tell you something. She says because insurance. No, people think that there's a great deal. Mm. So they just buy it. They're they buying a deal. cash buyers are buying like crazy because they think this perception of a deal. That's the, hilarious. The realtor says, Bob, I've got houses that I had listed for 950 and we couldn't sell it. The house gets destroyed and I'm selling it for 1.3. Yeah, because they that's so funny. So what happens is these investors or out of state. Out of state, what they're doing is is that they start looking for an opportunity. Mm -hmm. Then what happens is they instantly, like like any other product that you could buy, they get themselves into that sales mm -hmm. process, and they're like, they're already emotionally invested mm -hmm. in. I want, I really, deal. I really want to, I really want a Florida house, yep. right? And at that time, it's too late, and they overpaid for the house. Now that will drive that market up, 
right? I mean, it will absolutely drive that market up. I do think there's going to be new money in Fort Myers because yeah. everything is going to be brand new. Yep. You know, everything's going to be brand new. And so I think it's going to bring a whole new element there. But like, I am absolutely shocked at what's going on there. It's It, it doesn't make any rational sense whatsoever. Well, the funny thing is, I don't think that's just Fort Myers. I think that's it everywhere, honestly, even Fort Wayne. So like, People come into this market and then they're like, oh, well, this is a great deal. It's like, I'm going to pay retail. Yeah, I'm going to pay retail and, and the needs property work. needs a lot of work. And so I'm like, me like and like Tony, we're just like, okay, so wait a second. You're asking this amount for the property. It needs this much in repairs. By the time we get done, we're going to be at retail or over. Why wouldn't we just buy one that's on the market that's already go and then we don't have to waste the time and then, but people don't think like that. They think, oh, it needs repairs. It's a deal. And so that's happening to out of state people. And we're just like, it's, 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 it's so dumb. Yeah. And I'm like, dude, these people, these wholesalers are actually making money because they have people like that, that they can like just keep selling them to. And then I think whenever it does start to go down, I think that's when people are going to realize, oh gosh, I didn't get good deals. Cause like we buy our rentals. I'm not even looking at our rental numbers. Cause we finally got all of our financials our rentals don't make that much money and we're buying for like 50 percent of what other people are and our rents are like more aggressive than most people's they're still not making great money i'm just like so how are these people paying double they're getting at the same rent or less they're fixing their properties up nicer and we're not making money i don't get it so i'm like dude these people are going to lose some money yeah but you know there's there's losing and then there's write-offs <laughs> yeah i mean you're, you're depreciating the house at 27 right. and a half years right so you're getting that and some you know some some investors have different strategies 100%. some of them are saying look here's the deal if if you know whether they're whether they have the cash or whether they're financing it themselves like i mean back when rates were at three percent it was a no-brainer yeah. if you're at three percent and the rent covers it right yeah so um you know, the the thing is, is if, if it can pay for itself and I get a tax write-off? 100%. I didn't make anything, right? Did yeah. I make anything? No, not really. But in unrealized, yeah. Unrealized, absolutely yes. I did. And long-term, what I'm doing is I'm playing the Principal game. Principal pay down. Principal pay down, which is going one direction, right? Mm -hmm. And appreciation in the right side. Yeah. So And depreciation, tax write-offs, I mean, yeah. It's And so, you know, when and these are, these are investors that aren't as savvy mm -hmm. they haven't really done their homework it's not a full-time business for them they generally have other careers and other paths yeah. they're not 100 percent dedicated but like i want to get my feet wet and they're still doing okay sure. yeah whereas uh, it, on a business standpoint of, of view we look at it and we're like no that's not going to work for right, us that's not, like, that, that's not yeah, a deal. they lost 300 bucks a month yeah. but then they got to write off you know thirty thousand dollars of taxable income right. and then they you know, made $57 a month in principal pay down. And so at the end of the year, they're just like, well, it netted out. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm not an idiot. Yeah. I just, I just wanted a house. But I didn't you know? lose. Yeah. Right. right? That's, what, that's what we always have to look at too, is again, it's not necessarily just about the deal itself. It is about like the overall. So it's about where you're at too. So I guess that is a good point. Cause like, that's what we look at as like, okay, we made a lot of money flipping and wholesaling this year, like yeah. a stupid amount. We're going to have to pay like a a couple hundred thousand dollars in taxes we're like oh gosh but the good thing is then we have all these rentals that we bought and so then we're like okay let's do a cost seg let's freaking do like accelerate the depreciation now we have a way to do this so there are other benefits to it that i think other people don't really look at they only look at the cash flow so i guess that is um the other side of it that these people might be making more money and they're where they're at and they're just like oh, i want to go somewhere that does have less volatility so i guess that doesn't make sense to me it just frustrates the crap out of me because i'm like you guys are buying it for retail and it doesn't make sense just go buy one off the market It'd and be then, done yeah and then let us freaking buy, buy one of our flips yeah it's done so like then you already have one instead of like these wholesalers keep coming and like they're offering them and then they don't even know if they're gonna be able to get it sold or not and i'm just like dude you guys are like I don't know, it's just frustrating sometimes. Yeah, because like they're offering the people too much money and then like somehow they're getting it sold. And then so now people are thinking their pieces of crap are worth more. And I'm like, this is weird. Yeah. But yeah. Different but, different investment strategy, right? Different yep. different strategies. It's yep. not really my angle, but in the long term, yeah. we'll probably be they're still gonna be okay. They're we'll still see. gonna be all right. Yeah, we'll see. I, I hope I hope that they are. Because I think, yeah, they probably will be. Oh, yeah. yeah. In the long term, they will. Yeah, it's as just, long as I keep it. It's just going to take a, a long time. Yep. All right, let's do the final question now. We're 12 uh, minutes over. All right, Bobby, this is a deep one. All right. So <laughs> you're on your deathbed 50 years from now. 55? Eh, ish. I think you're 48. I'm just trying 48. to. 48. Okay, that's what yep. I thought. 
50 years from now, Bobby Bobby gambles and has too much fun in Vegas. And, he yeah, stayed up too late. <laughs> so he, yeah, he lost two years stayed of his up life. Stayed up too yeah. late, lost two years. The divorce took one year. Yeah. <laughs> getting downsized took another year. So oh, yeah. you're 98 years old. You didn't make it to 100. We just decided that just now. And <laughs> you have a final message to the world. And uh, it could be a sentence, a mantra, a paragraph, something you think that the world needs to hear. And it's your message. It's your legacy. It's what you're going to be remembered for. Take the time. I'm dealing with that, like, over and over and over. And it slapped me in the face a hundred times in this last 12 months. And, um, gosh, we just, we don't take the time. Um, um, we... We come up with we come up we come up with reasons and we come up with excuses and we come up with you know just the the dumbest things and we don't even realize it. I'll give you an example. We're you know we're at our we're at our, we're at our computer and we're we're deep into a you know a YouTube video and your phone rings and it's your mom. And you're like it's my mom. I'll call her back. Mm -hmm. That stinks, man. Mm -hmm. That you know. That stinks. Um, we're watching a movie, and you're in the middle of this movie uh, with your significant other, and your buddy calls, right? Mm -hmm. And she's here. She's right there. And you're like, yeah, I'll just call him later, right? I, I can't tell you, like, any other way is just take the time, right? Like, mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're, your friends call you, and, and, and I'm dealing with this on a personal level, I, I lost a really good friend of mine yesterday. And it was just a, f you know, a, a month ago, you know, a month and two months ago, he called me every day, like, hey, are we going on the side-by-side -side trip? Hey, you got to come on the side-by-side -side trip. Hey, you got to come on this. And I didn't go. Mm. And, and it's because I had the kids and, you know, so your family life gets in the way and you had your kids and, and you know, but ultimately it wasn't like I would have missed anything major to take a few days and go on a side-by-side -side trip, but like really i don't care like what you do for a living i don't care how much money you make i don't care how successful you get or how successful you know or whether you go bankrupt mm -hmm. the key to that is is that when we die it's going to be did you take the time mm -hmm. right did you take the time i'm terrible at it terrible at it like like i'm 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 hooked to my phone and and you know uh, Stacy says it all the time to me. It's like, you're not present. Mm. You're not present. So I am, I do have my kids and they're with me and everything else, but I'm on my phone, man. I'm not yeah. present. And, and I think that no matter where, how we do it, you know, we're just not present and mm -hmm. take the time. I mean, if you can make a moment and make a memory, take the time. Like mm -hmm. that's the one thing. And I, and I've, and I've heard this about, people that were on their deathbed is like, they just wish they would have taken the trip. They wish they would have taken the time, right? Like mm -hmm. none of it's going with us guys. Take the time, take it. Love it. All right. You got uh, any final thoughts or how can our listeners get a hold of you if they want to get a vehicle or whatever, whatever they think you could help with? Yeah. Um, we're at big city cars, uh, 4910 Lima road. Um, we can not only sell you vehicles that we currently have, we also have a new Ford store. Um, but we can also get, you know, we, we do have a relationship with the Chevrolet store. We also have a Chrysler Dodge Jeep. If you're exclusively looking for brand new, we can pretty much help you get any brand new vehicle you want from a prospective franchise. Um, but if you're looking to save a little bit of money and maybe you want to get a pre-owned 2022 with 2000 miles, we can actually run a locator service. We do a lot with local businesses. So if businesses are looking for major fleet accounts on vans and, and things, we can we can help do that as well. So um, our number is 260-212-1111 or bigcitycars.com. Love it. Awesome. Cool. Well, thank you again for coming on. And thank you guys for watching. See you on the next one. Peace.